Mechanical ventilation essentially defines the discipline of critical care. But the names and the buttons on the machine can often be very confusing for the uninitiated. So today we're going to cover a brief overview of mechanical ventilation. Clearing carbon dioxide is called ventilation, but obviously a ventilator does much more than that. Ventilator is really a poor name because it actually has two functions. It both delivers oxygen and clears carbon dioxide. The oxygenation functions of the ventilator is the easiest to understand, so let's get that out of the way first. Now while breathing in and out is commonly assumed to be responsible for oxygenation, in fact, oxygen delivery is not at all dependent on respiratory muscle movement. Oxygenation is strictly reliant on diffusion across the alveolar membrane. So when you look at an alveola and capillary interface, you see that there's always a significant gradient for oxygen diffusion into the blood. This act of breathing itself then does nothing essentially to change that concentration gradient. Therefore, there are only two ways you can increase oxygen delivery. First, you can increase the FiO2, which increases the amount of oxygen inside the alveoli. And second, you can also increase the number of alveoli that are participating in gas exchange. Now, this is accomplished by pressurizing the lung to force the alve alveoli open and stay open. We call this recruitment. To maintain recruitment, you need a constant pressure, and we refer to this commonly as PEEP. So, the ventilator controls oxygenation by adjusting the FiO2, and the PEEP. And so on a ventilator, these are the only two settings that you need to worry about with the oxygenation. Breathing in and out is required for carbon dioxide clearance. This is what we call ventilation. Ventilation is necessary because the diffusion of carbon dioxide into the alveoli from the blood has to be removed. Otherwise, the alveoli would be filled with carbon dioxide until there was no concentration gradient left for diffusion. So ventilation is simply the act of bringing fresh air into the alveoli to allow the diffusion of carbon dioxide to continue. So to understand how a ventilator works, think of it as an air pump. This pump can generate airflow, and it has a switch to turn it on. The air switch is controlled by a timer that turns on the pump a set number of times a minute. Once the pump is on, air is blown into the lungs until either a set volume of air is delivered or the lungs reach a set pressure. Then a sensor shuts off the pump until it is time to turn it on again. So the ventilator controls carbon dioxide by adjusting the frequency of the breaths and either the volume delivered or the pressure generated. The relevant settings on the ventilator that you need to worry about in this case are the frequency or respiratory rate and the set tidal volume and or the set pressure. Now why is it that I said you can either adjust the pressure or the volume and didn't say both? This is because the volume in the lungs and the airway pressure are tied to each other through the compliance of the lungs. The lung compliance formula is C equals B over P. In this formula, the compliance is constant, which means that when you change the volume delivered, the pressure has to also change. They're not independent of each other. Now, you're going to hear a lot of different acronyms for the modes or type of ventilation being used, and this can get pretty confusing. So just focus on the following three points. Number one, can the patient start turning on the air pump to deliver a breath, or is it only the timer? This is what we refer to as the trigger. When the patient can trigger the ventilator to start the breath, then the ventilator is set in an assist mode. Two, what controls the off switch on the air pump? Is it volume or pressure? The acronym for the method of ventilation will often tell you whether it's volume or pressure controlled. And finally, what are the oxygen settings, specifically the FiO2 and the PEEP? In the middle of the night, you may get a call about the ventilator alarming. Probably the most dangerous alarm that represents a true emergency is the high pressure alarm. So having an organized approach to this is absolutely critical. The first thing you need to do is disconnect the patient from the ventilator and manually bag them. It is unusual, but sometimes the ventilator can be malfunctioning and this can take that out of the equation. Next, you need to check the endotracheal tube by running the suction catheter down it. If there's an obstruction like teeth biting or plugging, then either the patient needs sedation and paralysis or the tube needs to be changed. 
If the suction catheter passes easily, then the problem lies in the lungs. While you're troubleshooting at this point, you need to get a chest x-ray as it's going to take time to get that done and it will help you in diagnosing the problem. A high pressure alarm can be due to high airway resistance, low compliance, or high volumes in the lungs. A sudden increase in airway resistance can be due to bronchospasm or mucus plugging. Suctioning and the patient history will often give you clues to the problem. High volumes as the cause of the alarm are unlikely since the ventilator will not suddenly start delivering high volumes without being manually adjusted. However, the volume delivered can be relatively too high if one of the lungs has collapsed from a pneumothorax, resulting in a loss of half of the total available lung volume. This is where a chest x-ray and clinical examination is going to be needed. A loss of compliance can occur progressively over time in conditions like ARDS, but you're going to see that coming. So it's not going to be sudden, causing the ventilator to suddenly high pressure alarm. The most likely cause in this case of a sudden loss of compliance is dynamic hyperinflation, where the lungs are overexpanded and they just simply can't accept any more air. The problem is that the patient hasn't been given time to completely exhale. And then finally, there can be combinations of problems like when bronchospasm leads to dynamic hyperinflation or ARDS causes a sudden pneumothorax. So you need to always keep looking and don't forget to call for help early. Today we covered some of the basics of mechanical ventilation to get you started on your rotation. We broke down the ventilator into oxygenation and ventilation functions and described the settings that control them. This is not intended at all to be an exhaustive overview of the ventilator and if you want more information, check out my other videos posted here. Finally, we close by reviewing a stepwise approach to the high pressure alarm, the most dangerous of all of them. Thanks for watching and good luck on your rotation.